Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the RSIS webinar, Does the United States Need a New Security Framework or Architecture for Renewed Great Power Rivalry? My name is Adrian Eng, and I will be the chair for today's webinar. Uh, before I turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Adam Garfinkel, just a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, please know that the chat and raise functions have been disabled. If you wish to submit a question for the Q&A, please click on the Q&A icon to submit your questions, and I will um, select questions uh, for Dr. Garfinkel. Please also note that inappropriate comments may result in you being removed from the event and barred uh, from entry thereafter. So without much further ado, please let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Adam Garfinkel. Um, Adam is the RSIS Distinguished Visiting Fellow, and Dr. Garfinkel has been the founding editor of the American Interest. He has also served as the editor of the National Interest and the principal speech writer to U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice while he was attached to the policy planning staff of the State Department. So without further ado, please let me hand it over to Dr. Adam Garfinkel. Thank you, Adrian. Nice to see you again, even if it's uh, distance seeing. Uh, I have a couple of housekeeping remarks too. Uh, first of all, I did write speeches for Condoleezza Rice. I wrote a couple, um, but I really wrote more speeches for Colin Powell, who was her predecessor. He's the one who hired me to do that job and uh, Condi just kept me on. Um, so I have a lot more experience writing for, for Pal than for Condi. Yeah, I also want to mention that you said I was the founding editor of the American Interest, and indeed I was. Uh, the magazine is now defunct, uh, probably forever, maybe temporarily. Um, it's, uh, it's a typical ugly story, a Washington story, but what's happened is that uh, basically the same names and faces that uh, those of you who have been reading the American Interest uh, for a number of years, uh, we founded a new, a new magazine. It's called American Purpose. You can find it on the internet at www.americanpurposeoneword.com. And all the familiar faces and names, Joe Jaffe, Frank Fukuyama, myself, lots of other people, Michael Mandelbaum, uh, we have now just shifted over and uh, under a new name, trying to do pretty much the same kind of thing that the American interest was doing uh, for the past 14 and a half, 15 years, which was which is basically to take a non-ideological problem solving uh, approach to um, uh, global politics, American culture, and 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 political culture. So that's, that's if, if you're wondering where we went, that's, that's where we went, <laughs> AmericanPurpose.com. Now, this is, the, um, this is the, the fourth and the final of this series of, um, of webinars uh, set in or near the nation's capital, the American nation's capital of Washington, DC. I'm about 10 miles right now from the White House. That's where I've been the previous three times that I've spoken with you uh, through this venue. This is the final one. Um, this is the, the, the first one since the uh, election has uh, uh, given some shape to what the next few years of American uh, life, political life, foreign policy is li liable to look like. Um, and uh, I, for one, am, um, uh, I'm no uh, naive. I don't believe that a single election can uh, change the trajectory of, of a culture or even of a history. Uh, nations don't jump out of their skins. Countries don't jump out of their skins overnight just because they had an election, important as they are. If this one had gone the other way, uh, I think it would have been real bad, not just for the United States, but for a whole lot of people. So I think we dodged a bullet earlier this month, but that doesn't mean that our troubles are over, and it doesn't even mean that um, Trumpism is over. Uh, the next couple of years, the next four years, are going to be just as interesting in you know, all the wrong ways um, as the last four years were interesting. And we have all kinds of other issues to deal with, it wasn't like um, when Donald Trump became president in January of 2017, that everything before that was just hunky-dunky and fine uh, in US foreign policy or in uh, US domestic political culture. So um, we have a lot of work to do in this country and that's relevant to some of the things I'm gonna say um, later on. Let me just, I've had a lot of trouble in these webinars of, uh, of speaking briefly. And that's because I can't read the audience. I've never given these talks before and I don't like these um, Zoom uh, technology um, things. So I'm going to make sure that I get to the point and get to the get to my conclusion because I'm going to start with it. All right. Does the United States need a new framework or architecture for dealing with with great power rivalry? Uh, no, um, not really. 
what the United States needs to do is to get um, the tools that it has used successfully for many decades uh, to work properly again. Uh, it needs to adjust and advance. There are some innovations um, that I would recommend and that other people are recommending that, that we do. The, I mean, the, world's, the world's changed in, uh, in, in the past four years. It's changed since uh, uh, Barack Obama took the oath of office in 2009. Um, things move along, you've got to adjust. So there are innovations. Uh, but the, these are these are mid-sized or micro um, uh, level kinds of adjust. I don't think we need some sort of broad strategic framework that uh, that no one's thought of or hasn't been haven't been invented yet. I mean, when you start, we start talking about architectures and frameworks, you're usually talking about um, uh, organizations, organizational charts, charters, uh, large plenary uh, meetings um, in, in multi multilateral frameworks. I don't. First of all, I don't see the possibility of that right now. It isn't like the United States is primus inter pares in the world the way that it was 20, 30, 40 years ago during the unipolar moment, or for that matter, during you know, the middle of the Cold War. Um, if the United States called a meeting like that, who'd come? I'm not even sure. Uh, so the United States needs to get its own house in order and restore a little bit of its reputation uh, that it, it, is, it, is, it is at least concerned with the, the, uh, uh, the task of international leadership, partial leadership. Um, which has been essentially renounced and abdicated by the by the Trump administration before the United States would you know could credibly make a proposal of that sort. Um, also, I, I just want to I just want to note just in passing that you know a, a great power rivalry. Well, yeah, there's great power rivalry between the United States and China. There's a lesser kind of rivalry between the United States and Russia. There's a still lesser kind of uh, rivalry between the United States and Iran and with North Korea. It isn't like these things just started again. It isn't like history ever took a, a Viennese lunch break or a holiday. These things have always been going on, which is why I was so annoyed uh, a couple of years ago when you know uh, various pundits uh, announced the, the return of geopolitics as if it ever left. I mean, you know, uh, uh, imbalances of power can make it seem as though um, things are serene, but below the surface, they're never serene. There are always challenges and there are always changes. And, you know, the idea that somehow you flip a switch and you have the end of this and the beginning of that, this is the kind of language that, that represents lazy thinking and ahistorical thinking. Uh, great power rivalry never surceased and it probably never will. So we're in a different phase of rivalry now with, uh, with, the, with the Chinese. Uh, in my view, the Chinese mostly started it. Uh, the United States didn't respond very well during the Obama administrations, and it responded uh, in Asia, maybe not so bad, but in other parts of the world, even worse during the Trump administration. So uh, there's a legacy uh, that, that tracks back some years uh, in the rise of this new rivalry between the United States and China. And by the way, let me just repeat, this is not a new Cold War. You, people who talk about lazy thinking, people who refer to this as a new Cold War uh, are either ignorant of what the cold, the actual Cold War, the US-Soviet Cold War really was, or they're just using the term in such a lazy manner that the basic predicates of what the Cold War was don't matter anymore. They're simply talking about you know, a, a geopolitical rivalry that isn't actually a shooting war, a hot war, a nuclear war. Uh, that's a very, very uh, attenuated um, way of talking about what the Cold War really was, and I think very misleading. So rivalry is the right term. It's a very fine word. We've had it for hundreds of years. It works just great. Um, you know, I, I let me just let me just again briefly tell you what I think the, the, the Biden administration, once it's once it's sworn in, um, needs to do. Uh, it, there are three sort of levels of uh, of action it needs to take. The first is kind of obvious when you say it, but until you say it, a lot of people don't think about it, especially people who've, who've never worked in government. Process really matters. Uh, it's not true that if you have a good policy process and you get all the parts of the government working together properly, logically. Or that even if you get the foreign policy and national security aspects of the government working working on the same sheet of music, uh, you can still make mistakes. You can still come up with with bad policies. Um, but if you if you're if you basically don't have a process, if you if someone like Donald Trump's trying to run 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 the foreign policy of the United States from the White House, just one or two people, a man who is encyclopedically ignorant. Uh, your outcomes are going to be a little sketchier most of the time, just statistically speaking. So process, I mean, there hasn't been a National Security Council meeting formally in I don't know how long, maybe more than a year. So one thing that Biden can do with the experienced people that he will bring into high positions in government, all of whom have served in the Obama administration, some of them in the Bush administration, some of them back in the Clinton administration, 
These people know how to make the trains run on time. They know what to do. They know how the government works. They know what, how the interagency works. They know how to liaise with people in other executive departments and with the White House. So this isn't going to be like these, these sort of, you know, these rubes and newcomers or from the past four years who had no idea what they were doing, didn't know what their inbox was going to look like. And that includes Rex Tillerson, you know, the first secretary of state, uh, who was a mobile executive, a business executive, no idea what, what, his, sec what his inbox was supposed to look like a secretary of state. Uh, uh, the adults in that administration, McMaster, Mattis, they didn't last very long. Uh, that's not, that's not going to happen. You're not going to see, you know, you're not going to see uh, revolving door cabinet officials uh, in a Biden administration the same way that we did in the, in the previous administration. I find that very unlikely. So these are experienced, knowledgeable um, people who have huge Rolodexes, who know, who know one another, know how to work with one another, understand that the intelligence community is not their enemy, it's not the deep state, and it, it will be a much more normal set of processes that will be reintroduced, and that will do a lot of good. Um, that will reduce the error rate and the gaff rate quite a lot. You're not going to have the president or any uh, any senior official referring to you know to other countries around the world as shitholes. Or that's not going to happen anymore. That's just not going to happen. Um, uh, the tone will change. Uh, the president and his uh, his guys will have the ability to change the tone, and that's very important. Uh, the reputation of the United States abroad has been deeply harmed uh, by the rhetoric and the tone of the past four years. We had a president who was exclusively a zero-sum kind of thinker, a person who didn't even understand what an alliance was because he couldn't conceive of a positive sum relationship. That's going to go back to the way it was before. And, you know, Joe Biden, whatever, he, he may not be a visionary thinker, uh, but he's, he has good political sense. He's very personable, and he's, he's not stupid. Uh, he served on the Foreign Relations Committee for many, many years. That's where I first met him back in the late 70s. He, he, he came into the, the Senate in 1972. Um, I met him first in 1977, I think. Um, uh, all those years on the Foreign Relations Committee and then eight years as vice president. And this guy knows, he knows the lay of the land. Not a visionary type. Uh, he's a little like George H.W. Bush, you know, who ruled the vision thing. Joe Biden is not a vision kind of guy. Um, he has political instincts. Um, it, his reputation in Washington among, you know, realpolitik, realist kinds of thinkers has never been very high. Uh, in fact, Robert Gates, uh, you remember who was the secretary, the Republican secretary of, of, uh, of defense in the Obama administration uh, once said that uh, Joe Biden had been wrong about every major strategic call in, the, in, entire, in his entire career. Uh, and uh, you know, you say something like, like that about somebody, usually that somebody will let it roll off your shoulder, but Biden did it, didn't let it roll off his shoulder. He actually tried to refute it, but it's largely true. Uh, for example, the 1991 Gulf War, Right, uh, he was one of the Democrats along with Sam Nunn. And they, he he was he opposed it. He opposed the 1991 Gulf War, but he was for the 2000 March 2003 Gulf War. He was for the first tranche of NATO expansion, possibly one of the dumbest things the United States has done in the last hundred years in terms of diplomacy. He has been wrong a lot, okay, but it, it, that's not even important really. Um, he has other people around him and near him that can that can uh, moderate his judgment and that can talk to him. He's, he's, he's not the kind of guy who needed a gaff squad like he did in the 70s. He's learned a lot. He's much more mature. Um, so far, he hasn't made a mistake, <laughs> not a single mistake, which is pretty good, you know? So um, he's not a visionary. You, you're not going to get huge frameworks and, you know, you're not going to get, I mean, <laughs> somebody's already written an article, uh, you know, a Chatterati, a punditocracy article about uh, the Obama doctrine. Well, first of all, when, you know, American foreign policy is, as Michael, the late Michael Kelly once said, when it's aroused, when it's nervous, when it senses an opportunity, it's basically um, secular evangelism armed. That's what American foreign policy truly is when it's aroused. So religious language like doctrine, the, the word the doctrine is a, a religious piece of religious vocabulary, is strewn all throughout American foreign policy. The Truman Doctrine, the Eisenhower Doctrine, the Carter Doctrine, the Reagan. We, we talk like that. It's because we think like that. We think of uh, international relations and politics as a kind of a passion play, uh, and the exceptionalist nature—you know, the self, self-endowed exceptionalist nature of American thinking about uh, its role in the world, the city on a hill—that um, has ebbed, but it's still down there someplace, and uh, it's still necessary to speak in certain ways about the American relationship with the world in order to generate political support at home for any activist constructive foreign policy. So there will be highfalutin language. 
you will hear the language of human rights and democracy promotion will come back to some extent. But Joe Biden is, is not a saint. He, he went to the University of Scranton. It's a Jesuit school. He's a Catholic. He had a Jesuit education. He is not a utopian uh, dreamer. He's a very realistic, pragmatic, politically savvy guy. And from that, you're going to get pragmatic, realistic kinds of approaches to restoring the American uh, reputation and position. And a lot of that's going to have to do with process. Now, the second thing, the second layer, so to speak, of what, what, uh, what Biden will need to do, uh, uh, the American presidential system is um, kind of odd uh, for most, e even for other democracies, even for other for parliamentary democracies. Elections really matter in the United States. And the reason is because of the, what's called the prune book. Uh, and that means that there are lots and lots and lots of Title C uh, political appointments that the president can make throughout the federal bureaucracy and including the, the national security foreign policy bureaucracy. So elections really matter because the president can put his or her guys, in this case, his guys in positions of authority. And what you end up doing is you end up uh, mixing new blood and old blood together in the bureaucracy. And you have a chance to reevaluate legacy commitments and, uh, and, and circumstances and do something on the order of a zero based reevaluation of where you are uh, with various other countries, with very, various other parts of the world, with international organizations, with alliance systems, with the World Trade Organization, the whole gamut uh, of alphabet soup acronyms that the world, the world runs on. This is what the administration, and this is the second tier of what it needs to do. It needs to re, with the appointees that, um, that, are, that are placed in office, need to do a, a zero-based reevaluation of where we are. So the world is not the same as it was, as I said, in, in 2009. Lots of, lot of, lot, a lot has changed. Pandemic change, changed things. We've, you know, we've deconstructed globalization to some extent. So the economic uh, domain is very important here. Um, but these are the kinds of things that can be done at the cabinet secretary level. They can be done within the bureaucracy. These kinds of um, evaluations and reassessments do, do not require a lot of presidential time. You're not going to hear a lot of speeches. You're not going to hear a lot of proposals. You're not, I mean, speechwriters will be speechwriters, and I've been one. And speechwriters like to make, make news. They like to come up with little nuggets of language. But don't mistake that for an overreach in terms of sort of architecture or framework. We really, the United States, we have all the tools in terms of interagency and bureaucratic and alliance structures. We have all the tools we need to do things properly. OK, it's just a matter of honing them and getting them to work again um, and, you know, thinking through, you know, what what priorities, you know, you know, a, a president who would try to do everything ends up doing very little. A president uh, who can't decide what's important and relatively less important ends up uh, functioning like nothing's really important. You have to be able to make priorities and distinctions. That's what leadership is really about. And you do that in, uh, as best as possible in a collegial way in the executive branch and between the executive branch and the Congress. And, you know, again, Biden's been a senator since 1972. He understands the liaison between the White House and the Congress. So you, you could hardly ask for a more experienced uh, uh, person to, to handle this reassessment of where, where things are. But the, the main reason that there's not going to be any kind of grand design uh, there's not going to be, for example, an, an announcement of, you know, uh, to change, for example, to change the uh, the hub and spoke character of the American alliance system in Asia uh, into something more multilateral and integrated and institutionalized like NATO. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, Biden in the past has made noises about calling a meeting, of a, I guess we call it a union of democracies. This is not a new idea. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, spoke about a league of righteousness. Uh, in his, I think it was in his uh, 1906 Nobel Prize um, uh, speech that he got for ending the Russo-Japanese War. Um, this was an old idea. Um, after World War II, right, well, actually right toward the end of World War II, um, there was a man named Robert Strauss-Huppet who was born in, um, uh, in Vienna, uh, was an American who, who, th who thought that NATO, the victorious allies in World War II, would be the seed of a new global organization, which turned out to be the United Nations, but he thought of it at, that it was going to be essentially a democratic organization. And when that didn't happen, um, uh, he thought, you know, uh, maybe it, it, a League of Democracies or some kind of an organization parallel to, but not displacing the UN might be a good idea. There was a guy named Clarence Street back who, who basically wanted to recreate the British empire. Uh, he was kind of an old Tory 
he wanted to recreate uh, an Anglosphere that included the United States, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Uh, in a way, Clarence Street was, in a, was the, the father of the five eyes in the intelligence world. So there've been all these grand ideas. And uh, when the Cold War ended, uh, someone as unimportant as me wrote a little article called For a Union of Democracies. Uh, I thought that, that might be a useful idea as long as you don't get out, it doesn't, as long as you didn't let it get out of control, you know. Uh, uh, so, so you might hear talk like that, and there may be some kind of a meeting like that, but a lot of it is going to be decorative, or it's going to be, it's going to be body language. It's, it doesn't mean that we're, that the, the basic alliance relationships the United States has in Asia are going to be overthrown or retooled or totally recalibrated. I don't think so. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, that NATO is going to stop existing. NATO needs to figure out what it's for and what it's doing. It, it needs to rebalance its burdens internally. All that's true. Uh, that's one of the things that the reassessment uh, has to be about. Uh, the United States can't carry the burden anymore of the grand strategy that it has um, that it is, has followed since the end of the Second World War, basically. And I'll get to that in a minute, real quickly. Uh, but the third thing we have to understand about what's going on is. Joe Biden is going to be eating domestic political crises for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for at least two years. And, you know, the new people who've come in, whether it's um, uh, uh, Tony Blinken or Jake Sullivan or, you know, uh, whoever it is, they can sit around with their staffs together and they can write these long lists of things that had to be fixed from the last four years. And they can write these long lists of initiatives and, and new things they want to do in the next year or two. And they're going to find themselves uh, in a queue at the door. Um, to the Oval Office, and the gatekeepers there, the, the chief of staff is going to be saying, which is a guy named Ron Klain, uh, who went to college with my sister-in-law, happened to know her, happened to know him. Um, they're going to say, guys, you're going to have to wait in the inner room right now. We have a, a lot of domestic political dumpster fires to deal with right now. We have the pandemic, we have the economy, <clears throat> we have health care, we have, you know, we have a lot of stuff to deal with. In other words, the bandwidth for foreign policy is going to be narrower than a lot of people suppose. So you could sit around and lose the context of where we are in, the, in, in, in America right now. And just, just imagine that domestic politics goes away. You could sort of have this neo-realist uh, myth in your head about how these things work, which they don't, um, and make all these lists and everything. And guess what? None of that stuff's gonna happen. Uh, what matters is what's the bandwidth for foreign policy. So my, my suspicion is, is that the president is going to delegate thinking and initiatives at mid-range levels to fix what's broken from the past four years and then to adjust what needs to be adjusted in the past 16 years, 12 years, right? And he's not going to have a lot of hands-on. There aren't going to be a lot of big foreign policy speeches from the president, I don't think. Secretary of State, yes, he'll give the pillar speech at some point. Secretary of Defense will do something similar. I don't, I don't foresee a lot of big headlines speeches with deliverables, you know, as we say, as we speechwriters talk about it, from the president uh, for a while, because he has domestic policy concerns that are going to, are going to uh, uh, overwhelm him or certainly take up his time. So what we're going to see is um, a lot of activity, I think, in the mid-levels in, inside the bureaucracy. We're not going to see highfalutin proposals and so forth, just a little human rights language from time to time. And what that means is uh, the process can be reset, the reevaluations can go on, policies can be adjusted as people, you know, get back in touch with their, with their, um, their colleagues overseas and, you know, uh, say, hi, where have you been the last four years? I've been, you know, having a problem. All that can go on and all that's, that's very positive and that can do a lot of good. Um, but there's a third level uh, of innovation that I think um, uh, would be nice to have, would be useful, and I think it's quite possible. The best way to get foreign policy innovation going, uh, not at the, you know, the high highfalutin you know, plenary organization level, but where it matters and functional level, the, the best way to do that is to link domestic, foreign domestic American political needs with foreign policy um, uh, aspects. For example, um, something having to do with you know, kind of a global I wouldn't call it a crisis, but a global challenge having to do with the movement of people, with immigration. That's related to um, pandemic disease and public health issues. Uh, certainly the United States, it's not enough for the United States to rejoin the World Health Organization. Uh, it's not enough for the United States to just have business as you, in my opinion, business as usual with the functional agencies of the United Nations, including the ILO and many others. <clears throat> these, these, these organizations were not functioning very well in the first place. And that's because um, 
Western governments weren't really uh, devoting a lot of resources, <clears throat> weren't devoting a lot of attention to these things. These, these functional agencies of the UN could be made to function much better than they have been. And when they're linked to domestic political needs in the United States, you can create partnerships, um, ad hoc partnerships. They can be bilateral, they can be multilateral, they can be regional. It kind of depends on the cases. You can actually create a lot of value added in foreign policy by extending these um, domestic political needs of the United States, which, by the way, are parallel with the domestic political needs of many other countries. All right. So it's this linkage between domestic and foreign and thinking about these things in practical, functional terms and using a lot of the international institutions that already exist. All right. That's the way I think to go about this. Um, let, let me just um, conclude. Uh, by just very quickly running over uh, historically, very quickly, when I talk about the, the, foreign, the, the foreign policy strategy of the United States, if you don't have a strategy, all right, if you don't know what you're, what you're trying to accomplish, you know, speeches and uh, 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 organizational templates, and architecture, none of that makes any sense. I mean, before you can actually create an organization or create a, you know, a, a big new thing, you've got to have a, you got to have, you have to ask yourself, why? Why am I doing that? What, what am I supposed to be accomplishing with that? What's the strategy? What am I trying to do? And if you don't know that, you, you, you can't, you can't push architectural designs up and you can't push policies and tactics down. You can, if you don't have the same sheet of, uh, if people aren't on the same sheet of, of, of strategic music, uh, you get a mess, you get a cacophony, you don't get a harmony, you don't get a symphony. So what's the strategy? And this is the problem. The United States has only really ever had three strategies since the beginning of the country. And the second two are variations on a, a single theme. Very quickly, this could take a semester, but it's only gonna take two minutes. The first strategy was the strategy of the very, very beginning of uh, the new Republic, which was get the Europeans out of North America and grab as much of the continent as you could. That was it, that was the strategy. And by the time the United States got to um, California and California became a state in 1849 and Secretary Seward bought Alaska, that was pretty much a successful strategy. That worked, okay? Uh, it caused a war with Canada, it caused a civil war. I mean, these things never run smooth, but that was a first strategy and it, and it worked and it died because it, it worked. Second strategy comes along with Theodore Roosevelt and Alfred Thayer Mahan, and it was called the, the twin anti-hegemony strategy. And to make a long story short, the idea was, it's not good for the United States for there to be a hegemon either in peninsular Europe or in East Asia, All right? And the United States would do what it needed to do in order to prevent the, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, congealing of such a dangerous he hegemon. There were two reasons for this. One, technology had changed, especially naval technology. It was now possible actually for foreign countries to get close to the United States, West Coast, East Coast, and actually do harm, you know, bomb things. Uh, uh, this whole story of why the United States annexed Hawaii, all this stuff, Philippines, uh, a lot of history here. Adrian knows it. We're not going to talk about it. But the other reason was the United States has a small government, small army mentality. We don't like standing armies. Uh, the founding fathers didn't want standing armies. Navy is different. Mar we're a maritime power. No standing armies. If other great powers can monopolize the resources of peninsular Europe or East Asia, so Mahan's thinking went, then the United States would be forced to uh, engage in basically constant mobilization to deter aggression against the new world. We don't wanna do that. So the idea is you try, you do what you can uh, to, um, uh, to prevent the, uh, the, the rise of a hegemon in either one of those critical areas of Eurasia. How are we gonna do that? Well, um, back in those days, um, the time, during the time of, um, of Theodore Roosevelt and afterwards, basically two ways, self-help and riding the coattails of the Royal Navy. Uh, and that's what we did. And one of the greatest examples of self-help was the Panama Canal. Panama Canal really worked as a toggle switch to get the American Navy uh, more easily between the, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So the, the, you know, the, the Panama Canal had a military um, uh, utility to it as well as a commercial utility. Well, guess what? That strategy failed. It, it collapsed uh, in war, in the Second World War. Uh, there were hegemons that were dangerous, Imperial Japan in Asia and Nazi Germany in Europe. Uh, when the war was over, the United States found itself with troops on both brackets, on the Eastern and the Western brackets of Eurasia. So the strategy was re, it was re-articulated and it was re-resized um, to be the same thing. 
it was a twin anti-hegemony strategy, but very soon uh, the potential hegemons changed. It was no longer Nazi Germany in Europe, but it was the Soviet Union, and it was no longer Imperial Japan in Asia, it was possibly China. Uh, and the methods changed. We were no longer riding the coattails of the British Navy. It was all self-help, but it was forward deployment. It was forward deployment. And the, the position of American troops on the brackets of Eurasia in Europe and in, and in East Asia, the troops were the ante that the United States put in the pot to play in the regional geopolitics of Europe and Asia. That's where the alliance systems came from. And the purpose of the, there were two, there, there was really a dual purpose to both of these alliance systems, though they're not the same uh, in terms of structure. One was to deter, of course, the would-be hegemon from aggression or from um, uh, uh, curtailing the freedoms and independence of these countries. But the other reason was to stop these, uh, these allies from squabbling amongst themselves, all right? Uh, so the United States ushered in over time because of its, of its role in Europe, a Franco-German um, uh, rapprochement after many, many years and quite a number of wars and you know, kept the lid on the relations between Japan and Korea, for example, in Asia to some extent. So uh, the alliance system and the whole structure and the United States did this at, at the same time provided common security goods with a, with a three ocean Navy and tried to liberalize the international trading order so that countries would uh, re recover from the war, would develop middle classes. And this was believed to conduce to um, to liberalizing their politics and to, um, uh, to anchoring democracy where it existed and to helping, helping, it, helping it develop where it did not exist. Because in the American mind, right or wrong, Tocqueville had it right or wrong, you can make up your own, your own view. There's this idea of the democratic peace theory. Democracy is good for world peace, the idea goes, because democracies don't fight each other. And basically that's true with a couple of exceptions. It doesn't mean that democracies are not bellicose sometimes, they obviously can be. But uh, most Americans believe in the democratic peace theory and there is some logic to it, though it's not entirely persuasive from a social science point of view, but that, that's basically it. So you know, what the United States spend, has spent a lot of money on, 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 on defense and national security. And you often hear tendentious arguments from people who don't understand the strategy uh, uh, who say, well, the United States spends more than the next six or seven countries on defense. That must mean it's militaristic. But no other country's military is supposed to do for the world what the United States military is supposed to do. You have the Seventh Fleet floating off of Singapore. You all know why it's there, all right? It isn't there to aggress or colonize, colonize these uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, so, but what now, all right? Joe Biden only knows this twin anti-hegemony -he -he providing common security goods that's, that's what he knows. That's what he lived. That's what he grew up. That's all he knows. But there are problems with, with doing that now. Uh, there are basically three problems. One is uh, the, United States, the people of the United States no longer understand the purposes of that strategy. Um, it hasn't been articulated to them since the end of the Cold War in any kind of um, coherent way. Uh, uh, not the 911 and the reaction to 911 deranged the understanding of what American strategy was. Uh, the second reason is that Americans feel that uh, we can't afford it anymore, that the economy can't sustain it anymore. I don't think that's actually true, but that's what people think. But the real reason, the real reasons, again, it's this, it's this um, sort of missionary attitude that the United States has toward the rest, the rest of the world. It's a passion play. When the American people do not feel virtuous inside of our own society, we don't believe we have the right to be a global leader and to tell other people you know, how, how the world might be managed. We just don't believe that. Uh, we don't feel that way right now. We don't feel that we deserve this. We are very introspective and inward looking. So trying to get back to this grand strategy uh, that saw us through and won the Cold War, um, that's a hard pull now for domestic political reasons. Uh, it may be a hard pull for financial reasons and we certainly need real burden sharing in the alliances. Um, and there are alternatives. I mean, there are, there are academics anyway who talk about offshore balancing, right? Uh, that the United States should act toward the world the way Britain acted toward the concert of Europe in the 19th century. There are, there's only a couple of problems with that. Back in the 19th century, there weren't any nuclear weapons, right? Uh, one failure, <laughs> you have a nuclear war, that's not good. And it's, 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 it's worth pointing out, by the way, that the, pre the predictions back in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, of how many countries by now would have nuclear weapons turned out to be wrong. And a lot of people, including a lot of uh, liberal internationalists, think that the reason for it is the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1967, 
That's a very nice, that's a very nice applause line, but it's not true. The reason why proliferation, uh, WMD proliferation has been as little as it has been um, is because of the American Alliance system. Uh, the American umbrella protecting countries, disincentivizing them from doing these things on their own. If the United States no longer provides common security goods, no longer provides that kind of security umbrella, a lot of nations are going to resort to self-help. And we've already seen some of this happening um, in just in the past four years because the credibility of American assurances to its allies has not been very credible during the Trump period. Uh, so you end up with the potential for mousetrap weapons of mouth uh, weapons of mass destruction proliferation in key parts of the world, including East Asia, including in the Middle East, possibly elsewhere. This is a very, very dangerous business. Um, uh, the United States um, uh, has, has, I would say within the past 30 or 40 years, has seen it as a major facet of its national security interest to minimize in so far as possible the proliferation of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. If the United States abdicates that role, there isn't any other power that's going to pick it up. And I think the world is going to be a very dangerous place. If the United States, by the way, last thing, last point here, if the United States hadn't, hadn't spent a lot of money on providing common security goods in its own enlightened self-interest, then uh, the United States would today have to be spending lots more money on defense and it would live in a much less secure world. And the same is true for most of, most of the United States, most of America's allies. So, uh, so much for tendentious comments about how militaristic um, the United States is as illustrated by its defense budget. That's just a bunch of nonsense. Um, <clears throat> uh, last thing um, for now. Uh, there are going to be tests. There are going to be tests. Whenever there is a new president, uh, some adversaries um, see how far they can push. So even though Joe Biden is going to want to focus on domestic politics, and even though he's going to ask his colleagues in the foreign policy and national security and the intelligence community to protect him from these things, inevitably stuff happens, crises happens, and some of the stuff ends up in the Oval Office. So the metabolism of the administration's foreign policy, as I've tried to lay out, <clears throat> there's going to be a rhetorical, a rhetorical resuscitation, you might say, of expressed American values. But you're really going to have, I think, a very careful, pragmatic uh, reassessment and rebuilding of relationships within the country and between the United States and allies and other countries. It's going to be a, a, a relatively meticulous, careful um, uh, process of, of, of rebuilding. Uh, and that includes rebuilding institutions like the State Department, which has been underfunded and dispirited uh, in extreme, to an extreme over the past four years. But crises are going to happen. They just always do. Um, and uh, <clears throat> how an administration reacts to a crisis in a given functional area or a given region creates a path dependency. That first seminal decision, uh, usually made in uh, the heat of time constraints and a certain amount of stress, that, that creates the beginning of a pattern, and that is predictive of how an administration will proceed, especially if the same personnel pretty much remain in their jobs. So if you wanna find out what the next four years are gonna look like, right, in American foreign policy and national security policy, the thing to really watch is the way that the United States reacts to the first crises of the administration. And there will be tests. I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, the couple of hundred soldiers left in Northeastern Syria come under attack. Uh, before very long, and to see if, if the Russians uh, and the Iranians think they can they can drive those those soldiers out of of Syria, that might that might be a place. Uh, in Afghanistan, there might be a test. Uh, there might be a test in the South China Sea. Uh, you know, the Chinese did this um, to Obama. Uh, Obama thought he got a promise from Xi Jinping not to militarize the uh, the islands, some of the islands in the South China Sea. He got a promise. And then what did, what did the Chinese do? And they, instead of sending the Navy out, they sent the Coast Guard out and they did it anyway. And what did the Obama administration do in reaction? Pretty much nothing. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the pivot to Asia speech and sending 400 Marines to Darwin didn't really fool anybody. I mean, if you look at um, you know, the backbone of American policy in East Asia during the Obama period, uh, not too impressive. In some respects, um, you know, uh, Trump for all the wrong reasons and inadvertently uh, in a way, re restored some of that just with, you know, talk about, you know, fire and brimstone North Korea. But, uh, but, the, but the Trump administration's failure to react, the things that it, that it said after the Iranian attack on Abqaiq, 
uh, in Saudi Arabia back last February. You know, well, they didn't, you know, Trump said they didn't strike us, you know, we don't even need the oil anymore. If the Chinese want the oil so much, let them, let them patrol the, the sea lines of communication between the Persian Gulf and, and the Pacific Ocean. What a crazy thing to say. What an irresponsible thing to say. We can we talk about that later if you want to. But um, uh, there, there are going to be tests and how the United States reacts initially is going to matter. Now you can't, you know, you could make an argument that um, um, Obama's uh, red line decision in Syria in, in 2013, uh, where he basically, you know, made a threat and then found a way to get around it and didn't do anything. Now, did that persuade Vladimir Putin that he could get away with Crimea the next year? Did that persuade Xi Jinping that he could get away with, you know, um, doing what he was doing in the South? I don't, nobody knows the answer to that question. You'd have to get these guys on a couch and then you wouldn't know if they were telling you the truth. But you can plausibly, you can plausibly hypothesize that, that foreign leaders take the measure of a man. They take the measure of the president of the United States. And if those first reactions seem pusillanimous, they're gonna push further. My, one of my bosses uh, in the Senate many years ago said that, um, you know, said two things that I'll, I'll leave you with. First of all, you can usually tell how any country is going to treat its neighbors by just looking closely at how it treats its own people. The other thing he said is that, uh, uh, you know, Leninist political systems who believe that, you know, uh, basically try to militarize politics, international politics, they're like cat burglars in a, in a hotel. They go down. They go down the hall and they keep trying the doors, right? And when they find the door that isn't locked, they go in, right? Same idea. Uh, the, of course, the most in, the most impressive, dramatic, and dangerous historical precedent goes back to the Kennedy administration. John Kennedy was a young man. He wasn't Dwight Eisenhower, uh, military general, hero of World War II. So what does Nikita Khrushchev do? He throws up a wall in Berlin. What does John Kennedy do in reaction to that wall? They don't do anything. Then what happens? That's the first test, right? Kennedy flunked it. What happened next? Missiles in Cuba within a year. See, that's how it works. So that thing to watch, you know, they'll, again, the processes will be fixed. The tone will be fixed. The relationships will be fixed. There'll be reassessments. There'll be rational thought brought to bear. There'll be some serious people with experience doing real studies. There may be an attempt to link American political domestic needs with international functional uh, um, uh, partnerships, which would be a great idea. And to revive some of the, improve the functioning of some of these international institutions that have, that have sort of like not, not performed very well in recent years. All that's great. But the wild card is always these out of the blue crises uh, that are formative of how administration congeals in terms of its own personnel and its thinking and the patterns that are set by it. So that's what that's what that's what to watch for. That's what to watch for. So I'll stop there, Adrian. And we'll see if we can uh, get some questions. Thanks, Adam, for a very interesting talk. So um, now we'll get to the questions and, and answers. We have we have a few questions. Uh, listed, but I'll use my prerogative as, as, as chair to, to, to ask um, the first question. Sort of trying to bring sort of your discussion of, you know, the, the League of Democracies and, and, and the pivot to Asia and, and sort of rethinking uh, a, a lot of, of, you know, the strategies and, and alliances. I was wondering how you would conceptualize sort of the role of the Quad moving forward, right? It's 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 yeah. been it's been you know the the Trump administration has has really pushed the the, the Quad and well, you know it seems as if it's an almost sort of ready made League of Democracies for the Asia Pacific or or, or the Indo Pacific. Yeah, um, it's a kind of an ad hoc group. It's a it's a group that has. Um, um, sees eye to eye on a lot of things. Uh, it, uh, it's got some muscle, it's got some wealth. Uh, it has a common uh, sense of purpose, which is to balance against uh, uh, the Chinese. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, uh, some people say, well, you know, this is, uh, it's an, it, it weakens ASEAN, it weakens the Asia Pacific Forum. It's in addition to and above, and it kind of diminishes these other multilateral organizations. And my basic reaction is I don't care. I don't believe in multilateralism for its own sake. I believe in multilateralism that has a purpose. And this is a, this is a good example of that. 
uh, it's it's also it's very important that these meetings take place just because people need to get to know one another. I mentioned crises. When there's a crisis, when there's a crisis that 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 requires coordination with with other countries, it's nice to know who you're going to talk to when you pick up the telephone. It's not, personal relationships matter. Organizational charts are very nice, but it's people who do these things. So establishing these relationships of trust, reliability, this is really important stuff. So I like that. Um, Here's the thing that I, I, I didn't mention. One of the, you know, as difficult as it will be to operationalize or re-operationalize American grant strategy to, you know, provide common security goods and to be sort of the webmaster of a series of alliances that where the United States is the only country that's really indispensable to the whole thing because it has the connections, you know, to all these various alliances, that, allies that allies don't necessarily have with each other. Quad, it's quad is starting to be a, you know, an, an exception to that. One of the things we need to do, it seems to me, is not only do we need the Germans to pick up um, uh, a little more of the tab in Europe, and not only do we need uh, a couple of countries in Asia, including the Japanese, uh, to do a little more, the Japanese do okay, but there's something more important than that. You know, Heng Chi Chen, uh, uh, my friend, and uh, Singapore's former ambassador to the United States, uh, likes to say, uh, at least in private, you know, sometimes not in private, she likes to say, you know, the Americans just don't listen. They don't listen to anybody. We talk to you, we give you ideas, you nod, you smile, you know, listen, she's right. Uh, the United States has treated its allies, especially its small allies, but even its big allies, as junior partners ever since the end of the Second World War. It's a habit. We need, especially in the case of Asia, it seems to me, to reprioritize the US Japanese relationship, which is, you know, part of the quad. We need to we need to consider think about Japan as essentially a co a co equal thought leader with the United States. It's not just about burden sharing; it's about ideas. It's about it's about understanding Asia and understanding the countries in in, in the Asia Pacific, and it's about giving Japanese credit, you know, for knowing how to think about these things. They they live in that world. They know that history. They know those cultures better than Americans Americans do. We need to be less self-absorbed and more humble when it comes to, you know, really allowing allies to be intellectual equals. We don't do that well. We're control freaks. That's a real difficult cultural shift that we have to make. But I think the Quad's a good example of where you have a little bit of that starting. But it seems to me that, you know, um, you know, even four four countries is unwieldy, and uh, it's not easy to deal with the Indians all the time. Um, for a variety of reasons. I think the key relationship there in the Pacific is still the US-Japanese relationship. And it's it's especially important now. You look at you look at the literature in the United States and the stuff that's coming out, it's China, 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 China. And a lot of people have forgotten that Japan even exists. <laughs> Japan is a very important country. It's key to the United States. Not only that, where I mentioned, uh, and this goes for Germany too. I mentioned the proliferation issue before. If the United States uh, ratifies its abdication from the provision of common security goods and that role that it played uh, roughly from 1948 on, it puts Japan and it puts Germany in a very difficult problem with respect to um, its basic security policies. It's clear in the European case, the Germans would really only have two choices. Uh, if the United States just weren't there. And the United States seemed to be not there uh, recently. I mean, President Trump basically disavowed Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. He wouldn't, he wouldn't um, confirm it. It puts the Germans in a very difficult position. Uh, just like uh, in the past, just like between World War I and World War II, you have this intermediate zone of relatively small, weak Central and East European countries sandwiched between Russia, this huge country, and Germany, the largest and wealthiest country in Europe. You have two choices, at least in theory. Germany can either extend security guarantees to that, that intermediate area, which would put it into a more confrontational or, or, or competitive relationship with Russia, or it can do a Rapallo too. It can reach an understanding basically with the Russians uh, economically would be and and sort of and sort of uh, you know divide that area into a kind of a I don't know a co-prosperity sphere at the expense of uh, the maneuverability and perhaps even the uh, 
uh, aspects of the sovereignty of some of those some of those countries. In order to extend security guarantees to these countries, Germany would probably need weapons of mass destruction. Okay. Now let's look at Asia. Same thing, same thing. If the United States were to either leave or be forced away from the mainland littoral of, of East Asia, Japan would be in a relatively similar position as, as Germany. It could be a security provider for a lot of the areas to its south uh, that are um, uh, implicitly threatened by potential Chinese expansion or Chinese pressure or influence, if not physical expansion. China's not invaded anybody since 1979, I know that. Uh, or it can make a deal, uh, maybe over Korea, it can make a deal with China. Uh, if it couldn't find Russia as a useful uh, and, and credible interlocutor, it, it might do the same sort of, it, Japan might end up trying to do the same sort of thing with China that Germans might try to do with, um, with, with Russia. If the Japanese decided they wanted to be providers of security in their zone, all right, even at the expense of a testier relationship or a more competitive relationship with China, they too would need nuclear weapons, okay? Now, if Germany or Japan, certainly if both of them, were to decide to be security providers for these smaller countries in their region against a potential hegemon, and they develop weapons of mass destruction, it would totally transform the domestic political cultures of these two countries. It would no longer be Jap the Japan that we have known since the end of the, since 1951. And it would no longer be the Germany that we have known, right? Uh, what would they become? Uh, these foreign policy, these national security decisions would, would decisively affect their domestic political cultures. What would they turn into? What kinds of, of polities would they become? We don't know. It is, it is the most portentous kinds of decisions you can imagine. So if the United States begs off providing common security goods in these zones, it puts tremendous pressure on Germany and Japan. And I don't like to think about what might happen as a result of that. That's the kind of thing that, that we're talking about, right? So the fact that the Quad exists, it's a, it's a lever, it's a, it's a mechanism, right? To control these kinds of, these kinds of I would you call it uh, ultimate or extreme kinds of decisions, right? The United look, there is no country in the world besides the United States that's capable of organizing and balancing Asian security. The United States is it. If the United States abdicates its role, there is no balance in, in, in Asia. It's just that simple. So if the Quad is a vehicle to keep us in, engaged and to help spread the burdens, and especially to, to, to treat other countries, uh, other, other leaderships for a change as equal thought leaders. That would be the best thing. That would be the best kind of an arrangement. And the Quad could be useful in that regard. It already has been. Thanks, Adam. Um, we have some other questions. Uh, we actually have a, a two-part question here about the first part is, in what way do you think Biden's security and economic policy towards China is going to be different from Trump's? And secondly, how do you think um, it's going to, to deal with hot spots in the Middle East differently? And, and, and I think there we can also combine a, a question about whether Biden will follow on uh, the, the Trump's uh, Israel-Arab peace deals. All those are that's a lot of questions all rolled up into into kind of a one one question, and I you know I'm not a prophet and I don't <clears throat> I don't have intimate relations with the people who are going to be in the administration. I mean I haven't I haven't gotten a call yet from Joe, <laughs> so I don't I don't really know what they're thinking, uh, and I haven't I haven't talked to Tony, to Tony Blinken since 1982 or something really a long time ago, <laughs> so I don't know, but <clears throat> let's take the China part first. Um, Joe Biden is not going to go back to uh, the early Obama administration policy toward China. Uh, uh, that policy, as I already mentioned in some of my, in my remarks earlier, lacks some backbone, and it had some consequences. And I think I think Biden probably understands that. I know Michelle Flournoy understands it. I'm sure, and I think she's probably going to be Secretary of Defense, which would be an excellent choice. I know she understands it. Uh, and there were people in the administration, in the, in the Obama administration, who were very distressed over the way that the president um, handled um, early Asian decision points, 
the same way that a lot of people in the Middle East hands in the administration were very distressed at how he handled Syria. Um, I don't think Biden is going to to be like that. I think Biden is really more of a realist and understands um, um, the interplay between hard power and reputational power and soft power. I don't think we're going to have um, strategic letdowns uh, when the tests come like we had in 2009, 2010. Um, also, things have changed domestically in the United States. Uh, I think it's been kind of a boomerang uh, for a number of years, many years, from Deng Xiaoping on, really. Uh, I think the American political class underestimated the strategic challenge that China represented. And this was abetted by a lot of Wall Street lawyers who thought making deals and offshoring American jobs was just a great idea. And we saw the reaction to that, got Donald Trump elected president, among other things, right? Um, Democrats <clears throat> uh, over time abandoned uh, their concern for American um, blue collar workers and union types. Uh, there are more public service unions in the United States right now than there are trade unions, which to me is a, deep, a great tragedy. Uh, and the Democrats became culture warriors and they became, um, you know, not interested in the little guy, not interested in the labor. And they have migrated toward the Republican Party uh, largely for that reason. Um, I think Biden understands this, again, coming from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And uh, coming from, you know, not from a wealthy family by any stretch of the imagination, I think, I think Biden gets this. Okay, so he's 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 going to be a lot more pro-union. He's going to be a lot tougher on trade because of political reasons, because of he's wanting to, you know, get his hands back on the unions uh, than Barack Obama ever was. So when you have people like Denny Blair and you know uh, intelligence and military people making a big deal out of you know Chinese theft technology and um, just doing things in an unfair way. I mean, like I said before on a different webinar, the United States did the same stuff when it was an underdog in the 19th century. So that's just the way it goes. But people are ticked off at the Chinese. And in fact, they're overreacting. Before, um, people didn't take the challenges seriously enough. Now they're overreacting and taking them too seriously. And you have, you have you know, wild, crazy talk of the Thucydides trap and people thinking that war is inevitable, which is very dangerous. It isn't inevitable. And if, by the way, just, comment, you know, starting a Cold War, starting a great power rivalry, or getting involved in a great power rivalry, whoever starts it, with a country like the Soviet Union is one thing, okay? You look at the size of the Soviet Union, you look at its ethnic diversity, you look at the fragility of the state, you look at how shallow um, the uh, uh, Russia's imperial history is compared to China's. Look at the size of China. I mean, you know, Russia transformed from from what, from, from a czarist empire into a revolutionary communist government into, I don't know what the heck it is now, a marquee democracy that looks more like, a, a, like czardom than, than the Soviet Union ever did. But the idea that somehow, you know, from external incentives and, and manipulating, you're going you're gonna to shape China, the West is going to shape China, I think is ludicrous. So if you pick a fight with China, if you decide to get involved in a, in a, in a rivalry with China, you have to think, how's this going to end? Right. <laughs> I can't think of a scenario in which it ends in only 40 years and in which the West wins. I just can't. This is not a, this is not the kind of a, a you know, a, a zero sum kind of a, a kind of a fight or a rivalry you want to you want to you want to um, you want to uh, you wanna get yourself into. You'd much more much more wise to take a 19th century frenemy mixed relationship kind of um, kind of approach to the Chinese. You cooperate when you can. and they will. We do that. They're realists, and you uh, you compete where you have to. Uh, but I think we I think a lot of Americans are overreacting. We talked about this a couple of uh, webinars ago. So I don't. I think Biden understands this stuff. I think he's pretty good on this. Again, he's not he's not a sentimental, you know, visionary, conceptual kind of guy. He's a pragmatic, rubber meets the road kind of guy. And I think I think he uh, also last thing on China, you know, globalization has been frozen and thrown back because of the pandemic. It was in trouble before the pandemic, we all remember. And the Chinese economy wasn't doing great before the pandemic either for middle income trap, uh, de demographic reasons, all kinds of reasons, we, we, we've been through this. So it's not like you're gonna, it's gonna, things are gonna snap back to 2009, 2010, it couldn't possibly. The, wor the, the world's changed, things have moved on. So I, I think the rhetoric's gonna change. I mean, like I said before, there'll be more remarks about the Uyghurs and Xinjiang, there'll be remarks about Tibet, 
uh, there'll be a lot of remarks about what the Chinese are doing in Hong Kong. Um, but is, is Joe Biden going to start World War III over Hong Kong or over the Uyghurs? I don't think so. You know, So a lot of this is going to be decoration. It's going to be verbiage. It's going to be designed to create domestic political support for an activist, constructive foreign policy. But are we going to see you know, uh, Don Quixote tilting at windmills? Uh-uh, we're not. Middle East. OK, a couple of things about the Middle East. Uh, I think I think President-elect Biden understands very well the, the danger of Iranian nuclear weapons. I think, by the way, that so did Barack Obama. When Obama said that Iranians are not going to get a bomb and we're going to use force if necessary to stop them, I actually think he meant it because he's a smart man and he understood what they're getting a bomb would mean. It would mean a mousetrap proliferation effect throughout throughout the region. You would have not just one or two um, countries with nuclear weapons, you would have six or seven. And it would link to places like Pakistan, who are on the fringe you know, of, the, of, the, of the Levant, the Middle East. And you would have <clears throat> essentially a situation where you would expect six or seven or even eight relatively primitive uh, nuclear, nuclear weapon systems, delivery systems, um, that because they're primitive and they can't be protected, would be either launch under attack or on launch on warning kinds of, kinds of status, that you could have that many different countries where it would be impossible, like in a bilateral strategic relationship, to calculate sufficiency for deterrence, right? And you would expect that that would go on basically forever without a nuclear weapon being fired in anger. I just think that's a highly, highly unrealistic uh, prospect. Uh, if, if there is a mousetrap proliferation process in the Middle East, there will be nuclear weapons used in anger. Millions of people will be killed. Innocent people will be killed. So I think Barack Obama understood that. I think that um, Joe Biden understands that, and there will not be an Iranian nuclear weapon, and the United States, if it has to, will use force to prevent it. Will it come to that? I'm not a prophet. I, I doubt it, frankly, because I think the Iranians understand that <clears throat> th their best interests are in creating the status of a near nuclear power. But if they go to actual deployment of a usable nuclear weapon, okay, uh, every single nuclear arsenal in the world is going to get targeted at them. Right? How does that help them? I just don't see. I just don't see it. So they want the status and and the reputational and deterrent value of being, you know, in in the club of a near nuclear or nuclear weapon. But to actually go and act, to operationally deploy a primitive system, um, they, they would have to have lost their mind pretty much to do that. So I think there. I think there's wiggle room uh, in this whole relationship where it's possible to prevent uh, uh, an operational Iranian nuclear force without having to attack Iran. I hope so. And I think the Israelis understand that too. Um, now about the so-called so peace deals, right? Well, we have uh, the so-called Abraham Accords with the UAE, Israel and the UAE, Israel and Bahrain, and, and now Israel and Sudan. Um, with the partial exception of Sudan, these aren't really peace treaties because these countries were never at war. They never fought each other. Um, the relationship with the UAE goes back 25 years in, in secret. Um, the Trump administration took a lot of credit for this, but it didn't actually deserve it. Um, the UAE and Israel were basically giving gifts to the Trump administration during a campaign year in hopes that if he won, uh, if he got reelected, they would get payoff down the line for making him look good. But uh, you know, the, the, the good offices of the United States were useful in getting those deals done, and they're, and they're good, they're useful. But I think, I think the administration really can't claim, Trump administration can't claim all that much success. What will Joe Biden do? Well, <clears throat> we're not going to see, I don't think we're going to see, just for the same reasons I mentioned before, we're not going to see a John Kerry-like attempt to solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I think the judgment will be, and I think it's, it's right, that as much as you uh, would like to make progress and actually get a big deal, uh, conditions are not ripe for it. Uh, 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 Mahmoud Abbas is a... Is, what is he, 80, 87 or 89 years old, there's going to be a Palestinian succession, exactly what it will look like, nobody really knows yet. Palestinian politics internally are, are, in, are disorderly. Uh, it's not time for a major initiative. Uh, it would be very nice if there were a national unity government or a non-Likud government in Israel, if you were going to do that. Um, Israeli politics are also you know, highly polarized and dysfunctional right now. Uh, the domestic political carrying capacity of the Palestinians and the Israelis could not cope with uh, that kind of pressure from the United States. So there's not going to be a lot of, a lot of activity, a lot of high, high profile diplomatic activity on Israeli-Palestinian matters. If 
if uh, uh, it, it's possible to get the, the normalization train to keep moving, if it were possible to get the Saudis uh, to normalize with Israel, you know, Netanyahu was in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, supposedly in secret, though everybody knows about it now, this past Sunday, right, uh, with Pompeo. Uh, uh, I, guess the, I guess the Saudis are thinking about it. I don't know. If, if, if the Saudis go along, if the Saudis follow the UAE and uh, the Emiratis and the Bahrainis, uh, and the, the Bahrainis don't do anything without the Saudis saying it's okay, they're a stalking horse, all right? So if the Saudis come along, that'll be a big deal. That'll be a big deal. Uh, so I think um, the administration will want to work on the periphery, you know, the context um, of, uh, of the, uh, the Arab-Israeli sort of portfolio. But I don't think there's going to be a high profile effort to try to solve the Palestinian-Israeli piece of the conflict. I really doubt it, at least not in the first couple of years. If things change, maybe, maybe Mohammed Dalan will become the next head of the PLO. And maybe Dalan will be that leader that we've been waiting for among the Palestinians for the past, since, since Haj Amin al-Husseini, since the 1920s. Maybe he'll be that guy. That would be great. And then something really big could happen. Um, and whenever the Israeli electorate is, is faced with the possibility of actual peace with the Palestinians, they always elect somebody who could, who could negotiate it. They elected Ehud Barak. They elected Shimon Peres. It's Khak Rabin. They could do it again. Right? Uh, it's possible within four years, but it's not going to start that way. Thanks, Adam. Um, we have one more question. So, so far, you know, we've, we've talked about geopolitics and, and the next question is really about geoeconomics and how do you think, right, sort of uh, the new Biden administration is going to re-engage Asia in terms of economics and do, do you see Biden uh, rejoining the CPTPP or RCEP? Yeah, yeah I, I'm, not a, I'm not really a, an expert on economic stuff. I mean, I have a, a kind of a, uh, sort of terminally stupid when it comes to money. Um, I'm a little like, I don't, I don't want to compare myself to Henry Kissinger, but Kissinger always used to say, you know, soft power and economics are very nice until somebody starts shooting at you <laughs> or threatens, to, threatens credibly and starts shooting at you and that stuff kind of goes out the window. But economic nationalism ebbs and flows in American policy over the years. It gets important, it gets less important, it bobs back and forth, depending on personalities and circumstances. Um, it's not my forte, but yeah, I do think that, um, Everybody on the Democratic side, I mean, everybody with a brain. I mean, I, I don't know who's going to be trade representative yet. That could, that could be a pretty important job in this administration for this reason. It seems to me that, you know, uh, leaving uh, the Trump administration, leaving it was like the dumbest possible thing um, because that's where the rules of the road get made. And, if, you, and if, if the United States isn't there, then somebody else makes the rules of the road. That's not, that's not in our interests, not in our allies' interests. So yeah, I think we want to we wanna go back and join that. Um, that's, that, that's multilateralism with a purpose. That's not multilateralism for its own sake. <laughs> you can actually get something done. I mean, the, the, for example, the World Trade Organization, this is not just Asia, this is everything. The World Trade Organization, the, the, the uh, dispute mechanism needs to be fixed and the United States needs to get back into it. It needs to be made better. It needs not to, be, to go away, it needs to be made better. We could do that. I mean, you need responsible leadership in China and other great powers to do that. But that's a great example, it seems to me, of a potential win-win um, uh, issue management um, challenge for the United States and China. Both both countries have interests in, in that dispute mechanism working. Europeans certainly do. And the, and, the, and the Biden administration will be smart enough to gather its own friends first before going and making representation to the Chinese. You don't piss off the Mexicans, the Canadians, and the Europeans, and then go and argue with the Chinese. That's just dumb. And that's what Trump did. So yeah, I do think, I do think there's, there's going to be a reinvestment in um, in TTP, and I think it's going to be a reinvestment in the WTO. I think there's also going to be a reinvestment in the, the linkage between the United States and and uh, and and the rest of it, and in Canada, Mexico. I mean, the NAFTA thing will have to be, you know, uh, uh, also um, modernized. And I think um, probably the Biden administration will spend a lot more time thinking about Latin America, about Brazil and Argentina, and so forth, for several reasons. Uh, part of its money. Um, I mean, Biden, you know, he, he was foreign, uh, foreign relations committee guy. And all the time that I knew him uh, back in the day and you know, my follow him, he hasn't been, what's the word? He doesn't show a lot of spark in his eye talking about economic stuff. That's just not something he, that excites him. 
So I think it's going to it's going to re- well it's going to depend on you know uh, who's going to be Secretary of Commerce, who's going to be the Trade Representative. Uh, we know Janet Yellen's going to be in the Treasury, and she will pick an internet you know one of her deputies will be uh, you know international organization deputy. Um, I don't know who that person's going to be, but I think the personalities at you know at the at the deputy secretary level, uh, if the if those personalities mesh, you could get some pretty creative stuff uh, on the economic side, the international economic side. But I don't know who those people are going to be yet. But I mean, the president would be would be okay with that again as long as it didn't gore the ox of uh, American unions. But uh, it's not the kind of subject area that I think he's going to get enthusiastic about and lead and make big speeches about. Probably not. Of course, I'm interested in knowing who his, who his principal speechwriters are going to be. I might know some of these people. I'm kind of curious about that. Thank you, Adam. I think we've just about come to our lot of time. So please uh, let me thank you for, once again, a, a very interesting uh, webinar. And also to, to wish you a very happy, to you and, and, and still a very happy Thanksgiving. Oh, thank you. The turkey's ready to go into the oven almost. (laughs) And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for for joining us uh, for today's webinar. And you can always uh, check out our our website or the QR code for other upcoming webinars. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Bye, Adam. Bye-bye.